Good evening. Keep thinking that we entered last fall what might be called the 50th anniversary season. A season that will commemorate and reflect upon what was a very tumultuous, emotional, and transformative era in American politics. It includes the election and inauguration of John F. Kennedy. Lyndon Johnson elected as vice president. He ran simultaneously for U.S. Senator. Uh, he got the state legislature to pass a special bill. And as a result of his ascending to uh, the vice presidency, in May of this year, we celebrate the 50th anniversary of John Tower being elected to the Senate from Texas, the first Republican since Reconstruction. We have the assassination of Kennedy. Hence, we're in this place of history, the rise of Lyndon Johnson. And if you stop and think about it even more extensively, we'll be commemorating events. Freedom Riders, Selma, Old Miss, Birmingham, the Cuban Missile Crisis, the New Frontier, the Great Society, and of course, the war in Vietnam. And that's, I think, what motivated us to put together this program. And to do so, we've assembled a very distinguished panel. Uh, their accomplishments are described in the program. You could go on the website. It would take me most of our time to emphasize the expertise we have here. We have, first of all, Mark Updegrove, director of the Lyndon Baines Johnson Presidential Library and a presidential historian. Professor Sidney Milkus, the White Burkett Miller Professor of Politics in the Department of Politics at the University of Virginia, and he's also Assistant Director for Academic Programs at the Miller Center of Public Affairs at UVA. And Alan Lowe, the Director of the George Bush Library. Now, one thing we want to emphasize, following up what Jim said, our objective here is to discuss and reflect upon the legacies of this administration. It is not to defend or indict. And certainly these three gentlemen know enough they could do either, which calls to mind the Lyndon Johnson story. <laughs> of course. <laughs> Does it everything? <laughs> yes. He was interviewing for his first teaching job, fresh out of college little school district in Texas. And he's sitting across from a stern principal, this may be apocryphal, and the principal looks down at him and he says, do you believe the earth is round or flat? And Lyndon Johnson says, don't matter, I can teach it either way. <laughs> so these gentlemen could argue it either way. And so with that I'd like to begin with, with the first round of, of questions to each of them, an administration completes its time in office. How do legacies form in these early years? What was the initial narrative or interpretation of the Kennedy years and later the Johnson years? Who do you want to go first? <laughs> we could go. Okay. So to you, sir. All right, fair enough. Uh, let me just say that I, I believe that story is apocryphal, but in Texas there's a great tradition. You don't let the facts get in the way of a good story. I think that, uh, that, that legacies, it takes a while for legacies to form. And we are very myopic when it comes to evaluating our presidents. We are in the heat of the moment when they're still in office. And we're caught up in the passions that we feel for our leaders as soon as they leave. And you can see with George W. Bush, for instance, who left with an approval rating of, of I believe, 26 percent, uh, and was reviled by many, no offense, but, but, but the people couldn't wait for him to get out of the office. We were angry at George Bush. We, we, want, we wanted him to leave. Two years later, he comes out with a presidential memoir. It's a runaway bestseller on the New York Times list. Passions subside. And we begin to see presidents differently. Harry Truman is another great example of that. Left with an approval rating of 31%. But after a while, we began to appreciate the character it took to make some of the, the courageous decisions of his presidency. And we, we gained a greater appreciation 
for, for Harry Truman. So I think uh, it takes a little while for us to get outside of that presidency and to start seeing the forest for the trees. But to my mind, it takes a full generation until we can truly look at a presidency dispassionately. So that's my answer to the, to the, to the question, yeah. Sid. I, I think um, I'm, I'm going to respond. That's an excellent answer to the question in general terms. I, but, but I was thinking about uh, Kennedy and Johnson all week after uh, and, and wondering what a legacy is. And I have to say, as somebody who apparently helps shape legacies, writes about political history, I'm rather sobered by how little political historians or political scientists who write about history have established the legacy of Kennedy and Johnson. And I'm also struck, I, I don't disagree at all with Mark's, with what Mark says about perspective, and I think we are getting some perspective on Kennedy and Johnson, which we'll talk about tonight. But I'm, I'm, I'm really struck as, a, as someone who kind of came of age in the late 60s and early 70s, <coughs> how frozen in time uh, the Kennedy and Johnson legacies are, and how difficult, even with the facts, uh, and we don't care about facts in Pennsylvania either. <laughs> uh, even with the facts, how they've been difficult to change. And Kennedy particularly, his legacy starts right where we're sitting. The powerful uh, impact of his assassination. Uh, and, and the way that he became very quickly a martyr. And, and what, one of the things I've noticed about writing about Kennedy and getting reactions to what I write, my facts, is that Kennedy is part of myth not of history. And it really wasn't historians who set that myth. Uh, one thing I've learned is it was, above all, Jackie Kennedy who, who established uh, the myth of, of, of John Kennedy. She was an incredibly astute lady. And one of the things she figured out is that um, it wasn't going to be historians like Sid Milkis who write dusty, dull books about presidents who are going to really establish John Kennedy's legacy, or at least that's not what she wanted. She understood the importance of symbols and image in politics. And the fact that television was so important probably enhanced uh, her understanding of that. And soon after the assassination, uh, she summoned Theodore White, a, a very famous journalist who had written a great but riveting book on the making of the presidency in 1960. And she knew he was writing an article for Life Magazine that was going to come out in December. And Life Magazine was a really popular magazine. It had a, I think it had a circulation of 30 million people. And, and this was going to be a special issue that was going to go out to a lot more people than that. And at that interview up in Hyannisport, she talked about how she and Jack uh, loved the play Camelot, which was a big hit on Broadway at, at, at that time. And before they went to bed, now don't snicker, <laughs> before they went to bed, they would listen to the recording that was made of, uh, of poor Camelot. Uh, and uh, I, I was going to, uh, I should know this line, but I'm, I'm st I've got stage fright. <laughs> so I brought, I brought a cheat sheet. And, and this is, uh, and think of Richard Burton when I say this, who played <laughs> King Arthur in the play Camelot. I real, people usually think of Richard Burton when they hear me. Don't let it be forgot that once there was a spot for one brief shining moment that was known as Camelot. And Theodore White wrote this whole, um, article on Kennedy stressing this Camelot theme. Now, interestingly enough, when the first draft went in the Life magazine, the editors wanted to pull it out. Think it was maudlin. It was, it was clawing. Jackie Kennedy got on the phone and says, it stays in, or I'll never have anything to do with Life magazine again. And, and, and I'm really struck by how that Camelot theme has got embedded in, in American myth and, and has been kind of frozen. Uh, in time, even, and we'll talk, I'm sure, later about books like people by people like Seymour, Seymour Hirsch, mm -hmm. The Dark Side of Camelot, but it hasn't tarnished that much, uh, the armor okay, of, of uh, John Kennedy. You guys are hard acts to follow. I've, <laughs> I've chosen poorly well, you, in my seat location. <laughs> <laughs> I just, uh, just want to second what my colleagues have said. I mean, when an administration ends, obviously there are a number of storylines that have been developed or are developing as they leave office. and. I think an important thing to do is to realize that it does take time and research to really do a good objective analysis of that, of that administration. One thing I love about presidential libraries, I, admittedly I'm biased, I love the libraries, we represent that information. We present the raw material of history so that as those passions cool, um, people, researchers can come in and see what really happened in that administration. Uh, I think there is some danger to that though. We, we always approach any research 
with a set of bias of our own. We, we, we go into it with, with certain assumptions. So just because 10 or 12 or 20 years have passed doesn't mean we're necessarily being more objective. It all depends on how we use that information and how we analyze it. Um, so I think a lot of the initial storylines we see coming out of any administration are not based on any type of substantive research. They're often very partisan, very journalistic in their approach, uh, based on the immediacy of the issues of that day. I think it takes time for that to cool and for us to start looking at it. Oftentimes what you see is either very fawning or very attacking, and I think that changes over time. Also on the flip side of that, though, of course, and we're seeing this now with the, with the Bush administration, you start to see memoirs coming out. Now, the President, President Bush, as you know, just recently put out his book, Mrs. Bush, last year. You see this with each, each administration. And typically, though not always, typically those administration memoirs are very supporting. Uh, you have to understand the perspective from which they're coming, but at the same time, I think they're very, very important uh, additions to the, uh, to the historic record. You know, one other general comment as I was thinking about this program, and it's very fascinating to look at the presidents and to see when they th start thinking about their legacies. I don't know if you've read the, the new Taylor Branch book, The Clinton Tapes. Uh, when, they started when Bill Clinton started talking to Taylor Branch, it was prior to the inauguration. And he was already talking about, what is my legacy going to be? <laughs> and very fascinating to me. That, that I haven't gotten all the way through that book yet, but already a very fascinating read. So uh, again, not, not speaking specifically about our presence here, it's the, the, the idea of legacy. What is a legacy? Uh, to me, the importance of the presidency. Again, it's one of the reasons I've chosen this as my life's work the centrality of that office to our political experience, uh, to how we move forward as a nation, uh, to the more nitty gritty of how public policy is made, the effect of, of the presidency on our lives. Just think about the effect that both Kennedy and Johnson had on our lives today and will into the far distant future. Um, you know, I found a quote, Herbert Hoover was very humble when he said, uh, he was asked what former presidents do and he said, we spend our days taking pills and dedicating libraries. <laughs> uh, former presidents now do much more than that. He didn't mean presidential libraries. <laughs> that's right, that's right, right. And their legacies, though, really do help determine our course as a nation. So, um, May I offer a quick anecdote relating to Hoover, and it, it relates to, to Johnson as well. Uh, Alan and I report to a woman named Sharon Fawcett, who's been with presidential libraries for a, a long time. She now heads up all of presidential libraries back in Washington. And she started her career at the LBJ Library. And, and President Johnson, former President Johnson, went to the, the existing presidential libraries at the time to see how he wanted his presidential library to, to be formulated. And he went to the Hoover Library in West Branch, Iowa. And she talks of him convening the staff upon uh, arriving back at the uh, at the LBJ library, and he talked about how he always misunderstood Hoover. He had always seen Hoover as the scapegoat uh, for the depression, and thought he was a failure as a president. But upon going through this presidential library and understanding more about his life, he realized what a great man he was. This is a man who had fed war-torn Europe and in World War I and in World War II as a, as a former president, and the tremendous accomplishments that he racked up throughout the course of his life. And he said to the, to the staff, and I realized that Herbert Hoover was a great man when I went through that library. And that's exactly what I want you to do for me. <laughs> <laughs> okay, just to follow up how legacies form, how do they evolve? What is sort of the pattern of scholarly activity? Does there emerge a sort of dominant story or dominant interpretation of the Kennedy administration or the Johnson administration? I think yeah, there are dominant narratives. I think they change with time, and not to be too repetitive, they change as new information comes to the forefront. Um, I think. Truman, as you noted earlier, may be the best example of that of, yeah. of someone who's, whose narrative has changed significantly since the end of his, of his administration. To our uh, Truman, right? <laughs> that was the same. I, I think it's, uh, again, as I said earlier, the new information can be used in a variety of, of different ways. But if the, if, the, if the scholars are intellectually honest and you interpret that in new information, then you can certainly get a new perspective on, on those presidents. Uh, I think it becomes less important to score political points, for example, over time. Instead, you start looking at it from a, a more um, uh, a broader perspective. Uh, I think 
Um, someone, a good example of that may be Richard Nixon, to be honest with you. I think uh, there's a lot still to be studied with Richard Nixon. We, obviously, we remember Nixon for Watergate and, and all the, the troubles surrounding that. But um, if you look at his overall lifetime record of service, uh, the other things, particularly in the domestic arena that he did when he was president, um, then there's a fuller picture there. You may still end up at, in the, at the end of the day say that you like or dislike Richard Nixon. I think there's still uh, a great amount of story to be told there for him. Um, certainly the dominant narrative uh, with JFK, um, I think, is the martyred president who would have done so much if only if his life had not ended so tragically. That aura of Camelot remains, I believe, despite the Seymour Hersh's and Nigel Hamilton's and other people who have written uh, so many negative things about President Kennedy. I, I certainly grew up in a house where uh, John F. Kennedy was idolized by my mother and my father, and no matter how conservative they became, John Kennedy was still the president. I mean, he was the ideal president to them. With, uh, with LBJ, uh, I think so much of the dominant narrative when he left office was revolving around Vietnam, obviously. Um, but I think, again, that, that is becoming a, a fairer and more balanced analysis as we move on in time, uh, looking at the accomplishments of LBJ over his entire career. Again, I think you have to look at the entire career of a man and not just one or two actions, as significant though they may have been. Uh, certainly that is the case with the Great Society and seeing the enduring effect of the Great Society. Of course, there's a debate to be had on that. Uh, what programs were, were valid, what programs really worked, which, which programs did not. Uh, but again, a more balanced view happens over time. Yeah. I've been um, really interested in how Johnson's image has uh, changed over time. And frank, frankly, uh, I've, been, I've been trying to contribute to some revisionism of, of Johnson um, be, um, because Johnson suffered greatly. His, a, leg, a legacy of Johnson got frozen that was connected to the, to the celebration of the Kennedy administration as Camelot that really affected uh, uh, not only Johnson's reputation, but Johnson himself. He was really jealous of the, uh, of the uh, glamour of the, of the Kennedy family, had a terrible relationship uh, with Robert Kennedy. And one of the things that really hurt Johnson was the importance of television and image that, is, that, that made Kennedy such a celebration. You know, if you ask um, um, the American people who was the greatest president we've ever had, um, they say John F. Kennedy. Uh, the, poll after poll since the 1960s uh, says that. And, and next to Kennedy, I asked my buddy Jim Howell, he had a great scholar today, because I was, I was looking for material. You know, it's like Johnny Carson talking to his joke writer. He <laughs> said, Jimmy, give me some material. You grew up in the South. What did you think of Lyndon Johnson? He said, you know, Sid, what I really remember about Lyndon Johnson is he was boring. He reminded me of my high school teacher, which he was. And, and Johnson had great strengths and substance, but he was terrible on television. Uh, Lady Bird said he looked like a stuffed moose on television. <laughs> not, even, not even a live moose. But, but, so if Kennedy uh, was, was King Arthur and Robert Kennedy was Sir Lancelot, um, LBJ was portrayed as Mordred. Uh, he was the one who, who destroyed. Uh, particularly with Vietnam, but also because of his calculating um, lust for power, as it's been portrayed. Uh, Camelot, and this image was kind of frozen. These images were kind of frozen in 1991 in the popular culture by Oliver Stone's very celebrated movie, movie JFK. My youngest son told me when he heard I was coming to talk about this tonight, I said, make sure you talk about JFK. It's a great movie, Dad. <laughs> and that really, well, that's all the people have to know. Is, um, but interestingly enough, the, that movie, because of its heavy conspiratorial theory, um, encouraged the Johnson Library to release some tapes. <clears throat> Lyndon Johnson made a whole lot of tapes. Over 600 hours on the telephone, he was always on the telephone. They didn't have cell phones then, but he was always on the Latin phone. And over 300 hours tape, taping of meetings in the Oval Office. And those tapes, this is a plug for my, archiv my fellow archivist leaders here, have helped to round out uh, Lyndon Johnson's legacy. And one of the things that they have shown is how much enthusiasm and passion he had for civil rights. For example, I found, I'm now doing a, 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 a project on Lyndon Johnson and the civil rights movement. And what got me started on that is listening to these tapes, which are really fun. You guys should, should listen to them if you have not. And, and I found a tape where he called Martin Luther King on January 15, 1965, King's 36th birthday. And he told him, Martin Luther, Mr. Martin Luther King, Martin, he said, you got to stir those people up in Selma. You've got to do some demonstrating down there because you've got to help me put pressure on Congress so we can get this 1965 Voting Rights Act um, passed. 
I just found that to be extraordinarily fascinating and belied this notion that Johnson was just a crude manipulator of power. He was crude. We tell great stories. He was a manipulator. But it was connected to an idealism that really helped, that those tapes really helped uh, to convey. Yeah, if, if you haven't listened to the tapes, which I'm sure many of you have, please do. The, you, you have the, the weighty, substantive topics like that. And on the flip side, you have him ordering pants from the president. Yeah. <laughs> you know, this amazing yeah. variety of topics. Really yeah. it's a great resource. Yeah, they, well, uh, and I agree with what my colleagues have said in, in large measure. I, I'm writing a, a book about Lyndon Johnson now. And, and the first line of that I, book... I didn't know that, Mark. <laughs> <laughs> it's not on the civil rights movement. Right? <laughs> It'll be out next year by Crown Publishers. Because he writes you can interesting order it on Amazon.com. Uh, um, hey, do I get equal billing on this? <laughs> but the first line of, of the book is, history in its most cursory form is a beauty contest. Because so often we make these cursory evaluations of presidents based on ostensibly superficial things. How they show up in photographs, how they look on television, Sid just mentioned this, how eloquent they are, how graceful they are. And if you evaluate presidents in that vein, there are a couple that, that really come across really well. Uh, Franklin Roosevelt, John F. Kennedy, and Ronald Reagan. All right. Uh, and so I think that, that John F. Kennedy is, it, it gets this tremendous lift because he is so damned attractive. It looks like he and his family sprung from the pages of a J. Crew catalog. <laughs> Still to this day, I'm immersed with this, this subject every day, the 60s every day. And the other day, the Learning Channel had some home videos of the Kennedys. And I, was wa I watched it for 45 minutes at 8 o'clock at night. I was just riveted. They are a very compelling Image. And I think if you look at the, the I think Jim got it right, uh, the, 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 the enduring legacy of, well, let me go back. Clara Booth Luce, the famous playwright and the wife of Time Magazine founder, Henry Luce, once said that presidents are, are remembered in a single sentence. And she would famously lecture presidents. She would say, what is your sentence? It drove John F. Kennedy crazy. But I think if you look at John F. Kennedy's sentence, it's that he had the potential to be a great president. But he never realized, fully realized that potential. That was in the offing. And because he's martyred, he becomes an empty vessel, in a sense, in which we can, we can think things, we, we, we can think that he would have done things, whether he would have or not. He certainly would have pulled out of Vietnam, we think. Because he was smart. You know, he wouldn't have fallen into that trap. And certainly he would have gotten past the Civil Rights Act, because he was so passionate about civil rights. But we don't know those things. So I think that there was a the great potential. If you look at Lyndon Johnson's legacy, on the other hand, you have to concede that that sentence has Vietnam in it. And if it's that sentence is long enough, it has the great society as a counterbalance. But in my view, one of the reasons that I took this position, Lyndon Johnson is our, by far our most underappreciated modern president. And we'll break down the Great Society in, in a moment. I, I hope to, at any rate. Because if you look at the Great Society, it gets it sort of in this ambiguous term of Great Society. What does that mean? But when you break it down and see that it means civil rights, there's a president who did more for civil rights than any president in the history of our nation. Got rid of that, that blight that held us back from our promise as Americans. And you look at what he did in immigration and poverty, and education. They're remarkable accomplishments. Health care. And health care, absolutely. Medicaid. Thank you, Sid. So all those things to this point have been overshadowed by Vietnam. But as we go into wars in Afghanistan and Iraq that, that appear to be quagmires and have lingered longer than Vietnam, and those accomplishments of the Great Society continue to resonate, I think we'll look at L Lyndon Johnson, despite the crude image, that Sid mentioned a little differently. Yeah. Can I can I just um, sure. follow up that quickly? That I and and, and um, I know we're not debating, and this isn't a debating point because I, I I take the spirit of what Mark said. But he said Kennedy wouldn't have gotten deeply involved in Vietnam because he was smart, and the implication is LBJ. I know he didn't mean this, but the implication could be LBJ was not smart, and that's not true. Kennedy may not have gotten in, as deep into Vietnam 
as, as Johnson, although it was very hard for us to pull out of there after we were implicated in the assassination of Diem, because then the situation became more connected to the United States. And I think um, just as Johnson found it very, very difficult to disconnect from that situation, so would Kennedy. But my, my main point is that I think Kennedy wouldn't have gotten involved because he was much more um, a, a much more balanced, pragmatic leader than Johnson. In spite of the Camelot image, Kennedy was a, a very pragmatic um, a politician and, and never was very careful not to get ahead of public opinion or to take risks. Ironically, Johnson, who's got this reputation as kind of a crude manipulator, was, was, was much more, a much more ambitious reformer uh, than John Kennedy. Um, the Great Society is a much more ambitious programmatic uh, achieve, uh, am, uh, uh, effort than the new uh, frontier was. Now, and when people praise the Great Society, as they should, just as Mark uh, does, they, uh, particularly people who are, are uh, sympathetic to the Great Society, uh, disconnect Vietnam uh, from the, the Great Society and see it as, you know, this is where Johnson went wrong. It intruded on what was a great domestic program. But what I've learned in my research, which, was, which is quite interesting, and it goes to this difference between Kennedy and Johnson, is Johnson saw them as connected. He didn't think a society that could call itself great uh, could, uh, could, could not play a, a major responsibility in the world. Uh, the righteous use of force abroad, uh, an aggressive posture against communism in Southeast Asia, which was extremely risky. Eisenhower had avoided it. I think Kennedy eventually avoided it. Johnson got in deep. But, but I think these things are connected because the ambition, or to say it positively, or the arrogance to pursue a great society, a society without poverty, a colorblind society, those are great ambitions. But it's that same ambition that Johnson had, I think, that got him deeply involved in but Vietnam. I think the, the, uh, there is this notion that, that Kennedy would have pulled out of Vietnam, and that's an example of historical revision. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that didn't come to light until Kenny O'Donnell a Kennedy A did a did a an article for Look magazine in 1970, fully seven years after John F. Kennedy had been assassinated, and he talked about this this the, the, the fact that John F. Kennedy talked about pulling out of there relatively soon. But McNamara and Rusk and all of the architects of the war in, in, in the administration uh, mentioned that they never had that conversation with John F. Kennedy. Mm -hmm. Whether that's true or apocryphal or, or not, we don't know. But again, I think we'd like to believe when we see John Kennedy that surely he would have pulled out. But, but if you look at the advisors he had around him, if you look at his his administration, the crises he had to deal with with the Soviets, this was a Cold War warrior. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, I think he, that's a great yeah. debate to have, because yeah. I don't think in any way that's a given that he would have done that. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that he was, uh, Johnson was deathly afraid, not of the left, but of the right. He was afraid that if he pulled out of Vietnam, he would be impeached. Yeah. Because we wouldn't have been living up to CETO, an agreement that we had in Southeast Asia, and and uh, we would have been essentially handing the Soviets a Cold War victory. And I, I don't see that John F. Kennedy wouldn't have had the same fear, to, to Alan's point. Among you, how frequently do various revisionists account? I want to talk about the dynamic of scholarship, how certain events and our understanding or interpretation of those events has changed because somebody new comes along, looks at old information a new way, or finds new information. So yeah, just... Why don't you go? Well, I, I think revisionism is inevitable and is good. Um, and again, I mean, that's something that's going to happen over time. Um, I think the, the urge sometimes to do sensational books that o whose only object is to tear down our heroes, uh, I don't think that's necessarily a good thing. Um, I think there, you know, for example, George Washington. I know we're getting a little, little off our topic here, but if you, look, if you look at the efforts to, I mean, there are efforts to make him into a real man. I think uh, Richard Norton Smith's Patriarch is a wonderful book. If you haven't read it, please do. That that makes Washington real. Uh, but then the, on the opposite side of that, people who want to look at every negative thing on the planet about Washington and and try to tear down our heroes, Washington, Lincoln, and so forth. Um, I forgot where I was going with that, of course. <laughs> um, I think an, another wonderful book to recommend to you, if you look at how revisionism gives you a better view of, of presence when it's well done, is Whelan's uh, Mr. Adams' Last Crusade, looking at John Quincy Adams and looking at his work 
uh, in the Congress after he left the presidency against slavery. I think the same thing's happening right now with uh, Ulysses S. Grant. And I think we're getting a much more balanced view thanks to revisionist historians looking at new information, analyzing old information in a new way, in a very interesting way, I believe. So again, you know, I think every, every man is a mass of contradiction, let's face it. We all are in many ways. And I think that's magnified a million times by the office of the presidency. So when you have the passage of time and information that you can analyze in different ways, I think it leads, leads to good revisionist history. Mm. Um, and and a, it's a cycle. There are cycles. Yeah, it's really interesting. I, I think there'll always be revisionist history. Um, because it's a competitive business. Like, you know, somebody, one of my PhD students comes in and tells me he's going to do his PhD on Johnson's presidency. The first question I'm going to ask him is, well, what's new? <laughs> what is there, what are you going to add to our, our knowledge uh, about the, uh, the, the Johnson presidency? There's been, it's like, I did my, my dissertation on the New Deal and my advisor said, yeah, said there's been a thousand books on the New Deal. What could you possibly add to that? Um, and, and so there, there's always going to be, uh, some re revisionist history, and much of this is, is healthy and helps round out right. um, um, what can be a, a celebration that's uh, too exalted and, and a cel or a, a, a reputation that's too uh, diminished. Now, um, I, I have mixed feelings about some of the revision uh, that's, that there's been on, on Kennedy. I'm really happy with some, the revision that's been on Johnson because uh, I, I think he, he, he deserves rethinking as, as, as the, one of the most important presidents of the 20th century. Uh, the Ken some of the Kennedy stuff has been very thoughtful and important, like Gary Will's book uh, points out that, uh, that, one, that uh, there's much to be celebrated uh, about uh, uh, Kennedy, and, and one could look at the Cuban Missile Crisis. But one of the things that came out of the Kennedy administration, and particularly the way that the image formed, was a cult of personality in the presidency. Now, John F. Kennedy didn't start that. It really starts with Theodore Roosevelt, mm -hmm. who was the first one to, to call the where the president lives the White House. Before that, it was called the Executive Mansion. And Theodore Roosevelt said, that's not good. <laughs> we, need, we need a better image than the executive mansion. Let's call it. That was okay for Washington. That's right. not good <laughs> for somebody who, who wants to, in a sense, uh, uh, ex uh, expose the personal side of the presidency, has, uh, has, has much to offer in terms of their family and their, uh, and their own uh, uh, personality. And, and ev uh, but, so Kennedy didn't start it, but partly because of TV, he definitely upped the ante. Uh, and, and one of the... Um, one of the consequences of that is he greatly raised the expectations of the presidency to the point where it's been very difficult for anybody since Kennedy to live up to the expectations of, of, of that office. But the, the part of the revision I, found, I find really troubling is, is the kind of investigative reporting mm -hmm. that kind of took hold as a result of, of Watergate. And one of our great investigative reporters is this guy, Seymour Hershon. How many of you have read The Dark Side of, of Camelot? Only a, a small minority. This is a very virtuous audience. I must say, it's a, it's a, a fascinating book because it, it's so salacious. I mean, I don't. I'm from Philly, so I don't blush that easily. But I, but I was pretty embarrassed. <laughs> and it's, it, it attributes almost everything to Kennedy's sex drive. I mean, it says everything but that Kennedy ran for the presidency, so we had would have more women to hit on. It doesn't. It doesn't say that, but it's that's. It, it does say that Kennedy nominated Johnson. He didn't want to because Johnson knew about the skeletons in his in his closet and and kind of forced himself onto the ticket. I can see no evidence <laughs> of that. And, and that kind of destructive revisionism, which is an important part of, of the of the legacy of the '60s and the '70s and the disappointment we experience with Camelot uh, has, has created a, a contributed to a politics of destruction in, in America. Now we see it in our contemporary pot. We saw it with the Bush presidency, we see it with the Obama presidency, uh, which I think is very unhealthy. We not only disagree on principle, but there, we, we look into each other, we question the personal motives uh, of our leaders in a way that I, I think goes uh, too far. Uh, Dennis talked about the, the sort of the, uh, the, the narrative that begins emerging about a a president that becomes his legacy, and it's kind of like pouring cement. Uh, you know, it's malleable in the beginning, and it begins to harden over time. But there, are, there are reasons uh, to to revisit legacies, and they they come in two forms. In, in my experience, one, it can be a a, a new take on that individual through uh, an historical tomb, tome. I mean, and David McCullough is a great example of that. 
we've had revisionism um, uh, uh, on two historic figure, two presidential figures, John Adams and Harry Truman, almost as a direct result of the biographical account that, um, that David McCullough has, has written. It makes us take a, a new look at this individual, and again, in both those cases, appreciate them for their for their character. And I think we're we're looking at at, at uh, Adams and, and Truman differently as a result. The other is is and uh, Sid just mentioned this is something that's unearthed in in an archive, some revelation that comes to light, which gives us reason to reevaluate one's legacy. And in Johnson's case. It's, it's these telephone tapes that, that, that uh, Sid spoke about. And they give this marvelous portrait of a president who feels so deeply about transforming this nation. He sees fundamental flaws and, and wants to get things done in his presidency. And there's this great urgency to use the time he has in the Oval Office to, to pass laws that make us a greater nation. And Sid mentioned one of the best conversations, uh, this conversation that he has with Martin Luther King, in which he says to, to King, it's around the Voting Rights Act of 1965. You know what, if you take your folks down in, in, in Mississippi and Alabama and show the American people how difficult it is to vote, there isn't, and I think this, this, the, the word he uses, there's not a farmer in this country who won't look at that and say, we've got to change things. Mm -hmm. He's thinking about the average American and how that's going to sway them. And at the same time, King is offering him advice, saying, you know, if, if African Americans can vote, Mr. President, it means you're going to expand your base in the South. Mm -hmm. So they're, they're, they're sort of counseling each other. Uh, the other thing about these tapes is it, it does show Johnson's crudeness, and, and Alan mentioned this before. This what, what are we allowed to say? <laughs> yeah, right, right, right. There's an infamous conversation of him ordering Hagar slacks from oh, the, the scion of the founder of, of Hagar. <laughs> and he, he, let, let's put it this way. He gives some um, very detailed anatomical descriptions yes. <laughs> to talk about how these pants should well, be well taken. Done, well done, Mark. <laughs> uh, so you see these different sides of Johnson, but ultimately um, they vindicate Johnson in a way that the tapes that come out, that, that continue to come out about Nixon, um, you know, vilify Nixon. You know, it's, it's an inverted effect. Every time we get, the, you know, a new tape from the Nixon camp, it seems to damage Nixon. But when these tapes were unearthed for Johnson, it, it seemed to vindicate him in a lot of ways. Yeah. Can, can I just please? Add, I, well, I was going to ask. <laughs> can, I, can I just add something? There? Sure. Yeah, I, I, I wanted to um, just mention because Mark's really great points made me think of this. Is that one of the things that drives me crazy is that in every book about Johnson and civil rights, um, there's this uh, quote from Johnson. Um, All right, we passed civil rights. We just lost the South. Uh, and, and there has been a realignment, an important realignment in the South, and it is connected to civil rights. But I have looked, I am, you know, I am tenacious in my research. I've looked everywhere, I've listened to all the tapes. I cannot find the smoking gun. I cannot find where he said that. And what made me think of it is Mark's point where he was telling Martin Luther King, pick the conscience of the people in the South. We do not, we, we do not have to lose the South. The people in the South understand the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence. And Johnson said, by the way, the very same thing publicly in, in a series of very courageous speeches he gave in Georgia leading up to the passage of the 1964 Civil Rights Act, including a speech to the state legislature in Georgia, which, which said this, gave this spiel I, I pretty much uh, just, just gave. So, you know, being the, uh, in, the uh, aggressive uh, his, uh, political historian, I, uh, I had the good fortune to interview a lot of Johnson aides, including Harry McPherson, and I had a conversation with McPherson. I said to Johnson, was he sure, President Johnson, he was going to lose the South? And he said, and nobody was closer to Johnson than Harry McPherson, he said no. <laughs> he, thought, he thought if the economy held up, uh, that the Democratic Party would continue to do well in the South, what he did not anticipate, being joined to the to the to the controversy of the civil rights, was the the foreign policy issue of Vietnam, and it was and, and Johnson was devastated by the way the combination of the civil rights controversy with the Vietnam controversy led 
to, uh, he saw was going to lead to a potential implosion of the Democratic uh, um, Party in the South. And I think we underestimate how important foreign policy has been in the realignments in this country and, uh, and in the resurgence uh, of the Republican Party. I would argue, and, and I won't get into this because we're talking about Kennedy and Johnson, but I would argue uh, that a lot of Reagan's popularity didn't have to do with uh, getting government off our backs, but it had to do with his commitment to patriotism, his, his desire to restore the kind of Cold War mentality uh, that Kennedy particularly uh, uh, celebrated. Yes, I just had a couple of things real quick. Um, you know, I, I, as I was getting ready for tonight, I found a quote uh, from JFK that I think every revisionist or every historian should read before doing the work. He said, no one, no one has the right to grade a president, not even poor James Buchanan, <laughs> who, has not, who has not sat in his chair, examined the mail and information that came across his desk, and learned why he made decisions. Again, uh, again, I'm showing my bias as an archivist here, but looking at that raw material of history, of seeing exactly what type of information was provided to that president and why he made those decisions in the immediacy of that moment. Uh, the other thing I want to talk about, real, real briefly, Dennis, is, oh, yeah. is a great book uh, Den Den uh, David Greenberg did on Nixon called Nixon's Shadow. I think as we, as we look at, I'd love to, to think of that type of analysis for other presidents as well. He looked at how different groups over time have viewed Nixon. So how the loyalists have viewed him, how... Uh, of course, the loyalists view him as the victim of Watergate and so forth, uh, how the liberals view him as Tricky Dicky, as uh, how the foreign, uh, foreign policy establishment views him as the, the elder statesman. And really fascinating to look at the different lenses through which Nixon is viewed. And I think that's true for every one of our former presidents. Uh, can I thank the Right Honorable Allen for uh, defending James Buchanan? Not that I would want to defend him, but that was the James only president elected from Pennsylvania. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> and I was ashamed of that until now. Thank you. you we don't thank, know what went across his desk. You can thank John Kennedy. <laughs> yeah. The one thing I, I would uh, mention about, uh, and, and this goes to the legacies of both men, which is why we're here tonight. Uh, Sid talked very articulately about, about civil rights. But uh, the Civil Rights Act of 1964 was, of course, passed by, by Lyndon Johnson. And Lyndon Johnson resented, and I think rightfully so to a degree, the extent uh, to which Kennedy was credited for mm -hmm. civil rights. Mm -hmm. The Civil Rights Act of 1964 was not an easy thing to get through Congress. Uh, Kennedy had proposed it, but there was no assurance that he could have gotten it through. And there is no question that Lyndon Johnson used the martyrdom of John F. Kennedy to push it through Congress. It is very clear that was part of his strategy. He was using a slain president, saying this is the, this is the wishes, these are the wishes of John F. Kennedy, you need to do this. And he implored his Senate colleagues, against their will in many cases, to get it done. So when he would go back and say, and, and lament the fact that he wasn't getting credit, he himself was at fault. But you have to look at, at civil rights legislation is not just being the Civil Rights Act. It's a triumvirate of three things. It's the Civil Rights Act of 1964, the Voting Rights Act of 1965, which is all Johnson, and the Civil Rights Act of 1968, better known as the Fair Housing Act. Mm -hmm. Those are the three pillars on which all civil rights is really based legally in this, in this country. And I think they have as much to do with LBJ as, as anyone. I mean, there's no question. And that's why I mentioned earlier that there's, most historians will tell you there's no president who's done more for, for civil rights than, than Lyndon Johnson. In fact, Martin Luther King, when the Voting Rights Act was passed in 1965, cried uh, after the speech that LBJ gave in which he invoked the Negro spiritual, We Shall Overcome, which is more or less the anthem of the civil rights movement. Mm -hmm. and. He said to John Lewis, who's in the room with him, uh, you know, I loved President Kennedy, but I don't think he would have gotten this done for us. Johnson ultimately was a doer. He wasn't, he didn't have the image, but God knows he got things through Congress. And he has a legislative record that I don't think is, is rivaled by any 20th century president with the possible exception of Franklin Roosevelt. You know, you know, it's interesting. Johnson is really has no respect as a public speaker, and much of that is justified. 
but he did give some great speeches. And one of my one of the best is the one that Mark just quoted, the, the speech in defense of the 1965 Voting Rights Act, which which builds up to this climax where he joins hands with the civil rights movement and quotes this African American spiritual. He says, "We shall overcome." Uh, John Kennedy, bless his heart, would have never said that. He was too cautious a politician to say. And one of the things that's done my heart good because I. I really do admire Johnson is that the, uh, he is now credited with being a great civil rights president, not least by the African American uh, community. I read a great essay by Ralph Ellison, who's one of my fav favorite authors, where he said Johnson was the greatest American president. Uh, not even Lincoln uh, deserves the credit, and certainly not John Kennedy, uh, for moving us a step closer to the uh, lodestar of the Declaration of Independence. We are all created equal. Uh, nobody did more at the, in the presidency, in the Oval Office, than Lyndon Johnson. Okay, we'll do one more quick round and then have some time. You want a quick round with this group? Yeah. yeah that's, <laughs> that's very optimistic. Yeah. <laughs> well, we'll, you we'll, know, we'll, we'll try to discipline. It's a new frontier. <laughs> you know. uh, it's been noted a great deal of scholarship on Kennedy and Johnson era claims that the hope of a new frontier, a great society, was put to end by the election of Richard Nixon and the politics of the 1970s. So I'd like each of you to comment on that claim. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you can. Right. You already yeah, started right. that. Right. So yeah. I think yeah, I think that claim he was ahead is ahead of that, the curve here. That claim, that claim is is incorrect. I believe. First of all, the Great Society programs are still with us today. It's not as if suddenly Richard Nixon came into office and they were all eliminated, or even <clears> Ronald Reagan for that matter. Um, and I think also, and I've had a couple of conversations about this, it's really fascinating to study the Nixon administration and to see not only did he continue great society programs, he in some way expanded them and added things uh, that we, you know, nowadays we don't really think about Richard Nixon doing those types of things. Uh, the creation of the EPA and OSHA, um, uh, num a whole list of things, if you look at this, that, that Richard Nixon uh, actually uh, continued of the Great Society. I think with Ronald Reagan, uh, and certainly since then, you've seen more of a debate about the effectiveness and the appropriateness of certain Great Society programs, but you don't see any president going in and doing away with them wholesale by any means. Now, a great uh, young archivist on our staff, Paul, San Paul Santa Cruz, who's here today, uh, he did make a very good point, I will say, that after Johnson, you didn't see uh, Democratic presidents for the longest time running by saying, I'm going to uh, do more of the Great Society programs. You, instead, you saw Bill Clinton saying the era of big government is over. Uh, now, I think that's changed with President Obama. Yeah. Uh, but, but that being said... Yeah, he didn't Great really beat it. That's right, right, that's right, that's right. Yeah. And, <laughs> Only as, rhetorical flourish. As, as you discussed with us last night. So, um, yeah. <laughs> um, so I think, you know, obviously the Great Society endures. Um, it has, it, I think, overall has made this a more a just and fair society. Um, and uh, though we have um, uh, people on, on the right uh, saying that the era of big government is in people in the Democratic Party saying the era of big government is over, uh, these programs certainly endure. Yeah. I, 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 if I could just say, if people have questions, please pass your cards uh, to the folks yeah. and we'll get them here. Yeah, if so. you have a hard question, please don't. No. <laughs> um, I, I just wanted to add one thing to uh, Alan's great points. Is I think the Great Society not only, not only survived Nixon, who's often portrayed as the, the, the Prince of Darkness. Mm -hmm. <laughs> if, if Johnson's Mordred, he's the Prince of Darkness. It surged into the, into the yeah. 1970s. And one of the things we haven't talked much about that was really important to Johnson in, in defining and formulating the Great Society We've talked a, a whole lot uh, about extending the New Deal in areas like Medicaid and Medicare. We've talked about his commitment to civil rights. But he also talked about the quality of American life. And that was what really was to, to distinguish the great society uh, from the New Deal. Uh, and, and, and that meant uh, that uh, although material well-being was really important to American society, we, not, we must be, not be so obsessed with it that we forget about the quality of, of, of our lives, and we forget about things like human dignity. And Johnson was very important in initiating uh, environmental and consumer uh, protection laws. Um, but he only got started with that. Nixon embraced that with, in, with incredible enthusiasm. And I just want to underline uh, what, what uh, Alan just said. Who created EPA? It's a good trivia question. Right? Who created EPA as an executive order? It wasn't, it wasn't a law through Congress. Richard Nixon did. And there was a great expansion of environmental and, and consumer protection 
uh, during the 1970s, an important part of the Great Society, which I also think, also think and is, it, is deeply interwoven in our society today. Even if you look at the issue of civil rights, though, despite the rhetoric, um, the desegregation of schools in the South. Oh, so yeah. much of that happened under Richard yeah. Nixon. Right. Uh, yeah, right. just uh, if I, <laughs> uh, I told you, you shouldn't give us another chance. But, uh, another important thing that Nixon did, which uh, it's not talked about very much, but it's a controversial extension of the of the, of the civil mm -hmm. rights revolution. But in my mind, a very important part: affirmative action. It started with Johnson. Johnson was even working on this as vice president. But who creates the first national affirmative action plan? The so-called Philadelphia Plan, where I'm from. Uh, Richard Nixon. Hmm. Richard Nixon is is the one who really expands the notion of civil rights to affirmative action. Johnson's notion that opportunity is not enough. Equality, in fact, also has to be addressed. Hmm. Nixon um, embraced that for reasons that are complicated, right. uh, even more than Johnson did. Nixon, there's no question, Nixon was a moderate. Um, the Great Society be be comes under attack principally under under Reagan. And Reagan says famously in his 1988 State of the Union address, in the war on poverty, poverty won. Uh, that's erroneous, though. If you look at the rate of poverty when Lyndon Johnson, uh, when, when John F. Kennedy and Lyndon Johnson took office, it was about almost a quarter of this country. It's about 23%. After the programs of the Great Society and the war on poverty, that goes down to about 14%. And it goes down to its lowest point with Nixon at 12 percent. So, so the Great Society becomes a whipping boy for conservatives, less so the new frontier, because I think conservatives uh, laid off Kennedy wisely, I think recognizing that Kennedy is this, is this hero. He's an American hero, and that you kind of have to have gloves off. But Lyndon Johnson and the, and the programs of the Great Society were, were fair game. Uh, but again, if you look at the policies, Nixon might have been talking uh, about uh, the, the Great Society as being flawed. But if you saw, if you judged him by his actions, uh, you could see he was a great supporter of many of those programs. And indeed, many of the, some of the programs of the Great Society were flawed. But then again, any great grand experiment has flaws in it. And you can see that in FDR's New Deal, too. Many of those were overturned for being unconstitutional. Some of them didn't work, and they were suspended. But FDR believed that uh, doing something was better than doing nothing at all. And he believed in using the instrument of government to address many of the ills in our, in our country. He did so during a time of great crisis. Johnson did so during a time of relative prosperity. Uh, so there were, there were different times, and I, I, I do think Though, if you look at the, the New Deal and the Great Society, on balance, they are en enormously successful and transformative. Okay, we'll go to uh, questions from the audience. What are the legacies of Jackie Kennedy and Lady Bird Johnson? <laughs> Let them start we, need, we need some women's no, we do, we do. These, uh, I'll take a shot. You know, White guys in suits, you know. <laughs> Lady Bird Johnson is a lot like John F. Kennedy. She's just, she's, she's American royalty. Uh, she's beautiful. She's graceful. And, and I, I remember Hugh Side. Do you, you all know Hugh Side by chance? Hugh Side was a dear yes, friend of mine at Time Magazine. Magazine. Yeah. Covered every president since Eisenhower died about five years ago. And he talked about, it, and he knew the presidents intimately. He knew him incredibly well. He was very close to, to John F. Kennedy, but he, he talked about the fact that even though he was a journalist and had seen it all, he would see John and Jackie Kennedy glittering on the world stage, and he would just swell with pride. And I think you look at Jackie Kennedy, and you just you do feel that pride. You want to be represented by those two people. They're just so attractive, and they're so so graceful. Um, I think her image got a little tarnished when she married Aristotle Onassis, and I think she still she remains a bit of a sphinx. She's very enigmatic, even, you know, almost 20 years after her passing. Lady Bird Johnson, I, I, I don't know that I appreciated how loved, truly beloved she is in her home state of Texas. I don't think she has as, as prominent an image other places in the country. But this is truly, for, for anyone who's spent any time with Lady Bird Johnson, perhaps the most gracious mm -hmm. first lady in our history yeah. and did an enormous amount for 
the environment. And unfortunately, it's trivialized, or it was trivialized at the time, by being labeled beautification. They couldn't think of a better word. And it sounds very superficial. But in fact, it is hardline environmental policy that she is the champion of in the course of her husband's administration. Yeah. I, I think, um, you know, uh, Jackie Kenney's um, um, uh, stories about Camelot to Theodore White weren't just selfless. She wasn't just worried about her husband. She wanted to be Guinevere. Mm -hmm. And once that Camelot image was established, that really exalted her. And, and it was tarnished some by, by marrying Onassis, but only uh, uh, somewhat, I think. And I think Lady Bird uh, was, was really suffered from the controversies of the Johnson presidency and didn't get the credit as, as, uh, uh, that, as Mark just pointed out, she, she richly deserved. Uh, and that really upset Lyndon Johnson. I mean, he was jealous about the Kennedys for a lot of reasons, and that was one of the, the principal reasons. But she's really worn well yeah. with history, um, partly because she lived a, gr a long, robust mm -hmm. life um, and uh, had a, was, a real pre has been, was a real presence at the LBJ's school and, and, and museum. And so she eventually was deeply respect respected, partly for her, her work on, on beautification but also because of her, her grace. So she's just an extraordinarily engaging person. You know, Sid, uh, uh, I think Nancy Reagan took a page from the Jackie Kennedy yeah. playbook yeah. in, in uh, sort of casting the image of her husband that she, she wanted the public to have. Uh, and I think that, to, to, to a degree, it's hagiography. I think you're, you were alluding to that earlier. But the one thing I will say is that hagiography works. If you look at the images that we have, of John F. Kennedy and Ronald Reagan, that kind of treatment uh, really does work, uh, for better or for worse. Yeah. And the Obama and the Obama White House too. I mean, there was just an article. I can't remember where it was. I mean, it might have been. Uh, it wasn't in Time magazine, but there was just an article about how Obama learned a lot of politics from watching the Reagan presidency. And, and although he was opposed to Reagan policies, he really admired Reagan's leadership style. And, and that, that has played large, I think, yeah. in the way the Obamas have handled themselves in public. Just a quick word on Lady Bird. I was so fortunate to get to meet her when I was down at the Johnson Library and went to the Johnson Ranch. Um, and it was one of the treasured moments of my life. We were there and when the tapes had started coming out. And they played the Hager Slacks. <laughs> and I looked over and she was just crying laughing. It was funny. I'm glad she was crying laughing. <laughs> yes, I was just crying. We're crying and laughing at the same time. But I mean, of course, her work with the environment, her, her graciousness, I think she's an icon in American yeah. history for sure. Okay, I think this is a fitting last question. And the questioner writes, are motives, character, personality important to evaluate or should we focus on the outcomes mm -hmm. of an administration? Yeah, that's a great question. Wow, what that's, a great that's an question. easy question. I have no idea what the answer is, but it's a great question. <laughs> um, well, I'll, I'll just uh, answer with um, respect to Johnson. Uh, most uh, There's been an incredible focus in history, particularly Robert Caro's books, who's slouching towards his fourth volume on Lyndon Johnson. These are very popular books, and, and rightfully so. They're great reads, and they're carefully researched. But he's got one rock-hard theme, that rod that, run, you know, that runs through all of them, and everything Johnson did was out of ruthless desire for power. Everything. Bad or good. And, and so even when he starts, and he's in the Senate, he starts to get some to stuff that Johnson did that he liked, like the 57 and 60 civil rights bills, which Johnson... They were modest beginnings, but they were important beginnings, and Johnson was very instrumental in the Senate in getting uh, those through. And now he's writing about the presidency, so I'm sure. But the, he, he, he's kind of tortured by that. So what he says is, Johnson persuaded himself these were good things to do, <laughs> in, in all, <laughs> because he knew doing them would enhance his power in the Senate. I mean, it's really that tortured. I think that's ridiculous. Uh, frankly, I think it's not intentions are not irrelevant, and if you really wanted to get into it, it Johnson was a complex man. He he ha, he was a he did have a, a ruthless desire for power, but it was joined in a in a fascinating way with a passion for reform. There's no there's no denying this complexity, uh, and and what I, the problem with looking at intentions is there's an there's a temptation to simplify. Motivation. So a Kennedy, everything's from his sex drive or his desire to assassinate. Okay. Look, to get to the presidency, particularly in the modern era, you have to be a complex guy. You have to. Do you think President Obama, for all his charm, is not ambitious? 
I would have no respect for him if he wasn't a a a ambitious. And so this, in this attempt to personalize things really loses sight of the complexity of this fantastically interesting office. So, so you, you've stolen my answer there. That's exactly oh, what I was going to say. Um, I, I think, though, if you look at it, it, it is such a simplistic approach to think there's only one motive for one action. Just think in, in, in our everyday lives, you have multiple motives for doing things that you do. And certainly that is the case for every president, including LBJ and JFK. I think that we, we associate the, the term wheeler dealer with LBJ probably more than any other politician. And I think those historians who focus on that aspect of him lose the point. It wasn't about the wheeling and dealing. It was about getting things done. And yes, in many cases, uh, he, he did things that helped him to boost his power. There's nothing wrong with power, though, if you want to get things done. It was ultimately about achieving an end. That's what it was about. I, one, one thing I'll, I'll he say. He didn't mind the power. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and you know what? He didn't mind it. <laughs> and he, he, he exercised that power with reflexive yeah. ease. And you see that one of the reasons that we were able to transition, since we're in this great institution, so easily from uh, from John F. Kennedy's tragic assassination is because is this man was so comfortable with power. One nod to, to, to John F. Kennedy. Um, you can't underestimate the power of words. Words, even if they don't necessarily result in a deed. And no one did words as well as John F. Kennedy. And those words today still resonate and they still inspire, even though they don't, they aren't necessarily backed up by a legislative accomplishment. And that's why I think John F. Kennedy is a great leader. Johnson's a great leader because he did do. He did accomplish things that, again, had a transformative effect on this country. Hate to be re uh, revisionist, but nobody did words like Ted Sorensen. But, <laughs> but that's that's a whole other discussion about speechwriters, which I, I think we don't have time for. But drinks later on me if anybody wants to talk about. <laughs> okay, I would just like to give a concluding comment. This has been, I, I think, first of all, you get a sense from the panel's enthusiasm how fascinating these two administrations are. And just to put an end note on the last question, I observe, and this is something we can carry forward looking at other presidencies, is there's a strain in American culture, in American political culture, where the expectation is we want presidents to do the right thing, be effective, and do that for the right reasons. And that your answers to the last question reveal how wonderfully paradoxical it is to take undertake the study of the American presidency. So thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. That was great. That was great. That was really a lot of fun. That was great. That was great.